Hi, my name is Rob and I'm an alcoholic and welcome to part two of the virtual sponsorship series. Today's video, we are going to go over the second half of the doctor's opinion and pick up right where we left off in the last video. I had a lot of fun making the first video and it's my hope that you listeners are getting something out of this. Um, feel free to comment if you have any suggestions on how I could make this series better and uh, don't forget to like and subscribe on the other hand and as strange as this may seem to those who do not understand once a psychic change has occurred the very same person who seemed doomed who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol the only effort necessary being that require to follow a few simple rules. Men have cried out to me in sincere and despairing appeal. Doctor, I cannot go on like this. I have everything to live for. I must stop, but I cannot. You must help me. Faced with this problem, if a doctor is honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his own inadequacy. Although he gives all that is in him, it often is not enough. One feels that something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. Though the aggregate of recoveries resulting from psychiatric effort is considerable, we physicians must admit we have made little impression upon the problem as a whole. Many types do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. So... The ordinary psychological approach, um, it's safe to say that if you've been to therapy or you've been to rehab before and you find yourself still unable to stay sober, that you do not respond to that approach. Um, and uh, if, if these human means of help aren't cutting the chase and the power within you doesn't exist to stay stopped, then the only um, option left would be to find a power greater than yourself to, to restore you to sanity. I do not hold with those who believe that alcoholism is an entirely a problem of mental control. I have had many men who had, for example, worked a period of months on some problem or business deal which was to be settled on a certain date favorably to them. They took a drink a day or so prior to the date and the phenomenon of craving at once became paramount to all other interests so that the important appointment was not met. These men were not drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. There are many situations which arise out of the phenomenon of craving which cause men to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue the fight. So it says here that they're drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. And, and once again, like I said in the last video, this phenomenon of craving is, is the allergic reaction, the abnormal reaction that alcoholics have to alcohol. And when this allergic reaction is happening, it is impossible for us to control. Um, and, and it says that, you know, even though we may have had brief periods of sobriety, um, we always get tight at the wrong moment and end up back, back in the bottle. Um, I know in my own life, I can't tell you how many times I had a drug test or something hanging over my head and I had to just like remain dry for three days just in order to be able to pass the drug test and you know halfway through that allotted time i i found myself uh going out and getting drunk or getting high and completely bringing down the whole the whole situation on my head the classification of alcoholics seems most difficult and in much detail is outside the scope of this book there are, of course, the psychopaths who are emotionally unstable. We are all familiar with this type. They are always going on the wagon for keeps. They are 
over remorseful and make many resolutions but never a decision. There is the type of man who is unwilling to admit that he cannot take a drink. He plans various ways of drinking. He changes his brand or his environment. There is the type who always believes that after being entirely free from alcohol for a period of time, he can take a drink without danger. There is the manic depressive type who is perhaps the least understood by his friends and about whom a whole chapter could be written. Then there are the types normal in every respect, except in the effect alcohol has upon them. They are often able, intelligent, friendly people. All these and many others have one symptom in common. If you cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. This phenomenon, as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. It has never been by any treatment with which we are familiar permanently eradicated. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. And so with the classification of alcoholics, you know, this is kind of delving into like mental health and personality, basically. And uh, if I had to say which one I was, I would tell you, um, you know, it depends on which day of the week it was. Although I will say the one that talks about how we're the one that is unwilling to admit that he cannot take a drink and then tries to plan it um, in various ways. I feel like that one is probably the most dangerous one because uh, people in that mindset don't really stay sober. Um, but as far as the other ones go, you know, it's good to have a therapist um, when you're in recovery and you can kind of work that out with them. But as far as AA is concerned, it doesn't matter what type you are uh because at that in that last paragraph it says all these and many others have one symptom in common is and they cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving so that is the glue that binds us together in aa um, and although our stories are all unique in their own way you know uh we are unified in this uh, phenomenon of craving reaction that we have to alcohol. And once again, it says that it will never be eradicated by any treatment with which we are familiar with. Um, and that, and that rings true today, which is over 80 years later. Um, we still have not found a way to eradicate that, uh, phenomenon of craving. Uh, so the only suggestion is entire abstinence. Um, but the problem is, uh, we've already established that with this mental obsession, um, we cannot stay stopped. Uh, we get restless, irritable, and discontent. And uh, next thing you know, we try our hand at taking another drink, and then the phenomenon of craving develops. And around and around we go in a vicious cycle. This immediately precipitates us into a seething cauldron of debate. Much has been written pro and con, but among physicians, the general opinion seems to be that most chronic alcoholics are doomed. What is the solution? Perhaps I can best answer this by relating one of my experiences. About one year prior to this experience, a man was brought in to be treated for chronic alcoholism. He had but partially recovered from a gastric hemorrhage and seemed to be a case of pathological mental deterioration. He had lost everything worthwhile in life and was only living, one might say, to drink. He frankly admitted and believed that for him there was no hope. Following the elimination of alcohol, there was found to be no permanent brain injury. He accepted the plan outlined in this book. One year later, he called to see me, and I experienced a very strange sensation. I knew the man by name and partly recognized his features. But there all resemblance ended. From a trembling, despairing, nervous wreck had emerged a man brimming over with self-reliance and contentment. I talked with him for some time, but was not able to bring myself to feel that I had known him before. To me, he was a stranger, and so he left me. A long time has passed with no return to alcohol. So in this first story that... Dr. Silkworth brings up, um, he refers to this man who uh, had a gastric hemorrhage, 
So he was throwing up blood and a, he was a case of pathological mental deterioration. So he was a borderline wet brain. You know, he was losing his mind due to his alcoholism. And so the two most important things in there is a, he frankly admitted and believed that for him, there was no hope and B he accepted the plan outlined in this book. Um, so those are the two requirements to make a start in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, you need to admit that you truly are licked, that you truly have a problem. And then you have to believe that there is a solution contained in the 12 steps of AA. Once you, once you get there, then the rest will take care of itself as long as you do the work. When I need a mental uplift, I often think of another case brought in by a physician prominent in New York. The patient had made his own diagnosis and deciding his situation hopeless, had hidden in a deserted barn determined to die. He was rescued by a searching party and in desperate condition. Brought to me, following his re physical rehabilitation, he had a talk with me in which he frankly stated he thought the treatment a waste of effort unless I could assure him, which no one ever had, that in the future he would have the willpower to resist the impulse to drink. His alcoholic problem was so complex and his depression so great that we felt his only hope would be through what we then called moral psychology, and we doubted if even that would have any effect. However, he did become sold on the ideas contained in this book. He has not had a drink for a great many years. I see him now and then, and he is a fine specimen of manhood as one could wish to meet. I earnestly advise every alcoholic to read this book through. And though perhaps he came to scoff, he may remain to pray. So once again, we're seeing that this guy knew that he was um, in bad shape and that he thought treatment was a waste of time because there was no way that he was possibly going to be able to stay sober. Um, and unless he could teach him how to have the willpower in quotations to resist the impulse to drink, you know, he was doomed. And, uh, in AA, we definitely don't promise you the willpower to resist a drink. However, he accepted the plan outlined in the book, just like the last guy. And, a change came about him. Um, and I think that is one of the most unexpected results that I have gotten from working a 12 step program uh, is real and measurable change. You know, I don't think the best version of my old self would be capable of living the life that I live today. But in a way, I am not my old self. Um, this, the, through the steps, I have uh, change to the point where I have become new. Um, and in, although you came to scoff, I hope that you remain to pray. Well, that concludes the doctor's opinion. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I will come out with uh, Bill's story soon. Um, like and subscribe if uh, you enjoyed these videos and please feel free to comment with any suggestions on content or how I can make the production of this any better. Uh, God bless. See you next time.